Good morning. We need to work on our budget. Maybe we could do some fireworks or something during the song. That would be kind of fun. Hi, my name is Pastor Philip. I'm so glad that you're here this morning. We are kind of closing out a series in the book of Luke. Luke is, uh, was a really unique guy. He was, he was brilliant. He was a doctor. He was very organized. And when he writes the Gospels, he kind of, he's putting together a lot of comprehensive texts from all the different um, disciples. And he's putting them together in a nice chronological order. I love Luke. He's organized. He puts things in order. We can see what's going on. And Luke has been telling us the story of Jesus and helping us to see what Jesus was, his life was all about, what his teachings were all about, and what he was doing. And it's been really, really great. And we've really, really enjoyed it. And, uh, and this morning, as I was preparing for this message and thinking through what we needed to do and what we're, where we're going and how do we close this thing out, I was also setting up for a Sunday school class this morning where we were talking about um, what we call the Grace Summit or the Great Canadian Adventure. And some of us are going to go to Ontario to help our sister church in Ontario um, get a new start. We're going to start a new church in Cambridge, Ontario, Lord willing, in the fall. And we're bringing a team out there to help them and also to connect with our other churches that are over there in Ontario. And as we were kind of doing that, I started to started to feel a little bit nostalgic. I started to think about the history and the background of how things came about. Because it was uh, back in 1996, my brother Nathan and I, my wife Beth, and, and a friend of ours, Bartley and Sarah Sawatsky, and a couple other friends, did a trip. We, we, we took a little bit of a trip. You got, we, are we good here? There we go. Um, and we went to Toronto, and we, uh, we kind of looked around, and we were, we were looking at the possibility of starting a new church in Toronto with an intention of starting churches throughout Canada. In fact, we had a vision that would start a major mother church in every urban center in Canada, which we identified eight urban centers of Canada. And the goal was to start a mother church and for it to then the kind of daughter churches in that region. And it was kind of an interesting thought because I was thinking about, we had moved, I had moved from Maryland, where we were living at the time after we finished my graduate work, and with my wife, Beth, and we had separated ourselves in some ways, a good, what we call the 12-hour triangle. 12 hours to Maine, where my family was from, and 12 hours to Maryland and Virginia, where her family was from, and we had kind of lost contact with our family. The choice to go to Toronto to start churches there was a choice to be able to lose the relationships that we probably held the most dear. And there was a real cost, a real reality to that cost. But, you know, um, then as later on, we go to start the next church. Um, we were able to see good things happen. And, and while we were in Toronto, some things happened. But about 2005, we felt a call to come over to Vancouver. But while I was living in Toronto, I at least had some family there. My twin brother, Nathan, you probably can't recognize him because he's kind of buried underneath Anna. Okay? <laughs> so that's the, and this is just before we moved in 2005. We moved to come out here. And while I was in Toronto, we were literally, you know, just about 10 or 15 minutes away from my twin brother. He was working in the same area that we were. And we had this relationship. We had this opportunity to build friendships and build relationships. And we had his son, um, Isaiah, who's like really tall now and a great kid. And, of course, our girls at that time, we didn't have the boys then. And yet when we decided to go, when God had called us to go from Ontario to British Columbia, now we were 3,000 or 4,000 kilometers away from all family that we knew. And the cost now was not going to be only seeing family once every maybe six months, but now the cost is going to be seeing family once every two to three years. Grandparents, uncles, cousins, friends. That was kind of the part of the cost. But then the other thing that happened when we were in Ontario was we bought a house. And we had bought a townhouse in Ontario, and we were, we were really happy with it. It was amazing. God provided so many different ways. And we bought this townhouse, and we loved it. It was a really nice townhouse. And we finally owned something, because, you know, anyways, it's the way it is. So we finally owned something. We, we built this house. We were the ones who helped kind of design the inside and all the colors and all the craziness and all of the stress of putting together a new home. But then when God called us to come to Vancouver, there was no resources in our kitty as an organization. And so we took the sale of our house to help us move out here and start a church called Foodie of Hope Church. And then we were also 3,000 miles away from all of our family. And so it's interesting, when you decide to make a decision to follow God, sometimes there's a cost involved. Anyone recognize that? Sometimes there's a cost involved. And this morning, I think Jesus is wanting to help us see that. He wants us to look at that a little bit. And we look at the things that have happened. Last week, Pastor Isaac talked about in Luke chapter 18 and 19, he talked about the fact that God is the only one that can fix this. Remember that? It was one of our great phrases. God is the only one that can fix this. And he, he actually invited us to seek out a problem this week, right? 
How many of you did that? How many of you, like, some of you are kind of nodding, some of you don't even know what I'm talking about, and if you're new with us this morning, of course you don't know what's happening. But he invited us to seek out a problem and invite God into it, recognizing he's the only one that can fix it. And I think that's a really wonderful call, and uh, the reality is that God is able to do all things, and the point of, one of the big points coming out of the message last week, that he is actually good. The comparison was with a bad guy who had the power to fix it, and he fixed it because he was sick of hearing the person. And yet, God is a good guy, has the power to fix it, and we can ask him, and he's good. And it was really, really a powerful thought. As we think about closing up this series in the book of Luke, and who Jesus is, and what he's talking about, he's talking about the Father, as a good Father, who has all authority, and all power, and we can go to him. In fact, if we're actually wise, if we actually understand the world in this right order, he's actually the only one who can really fix it. And the problem that we often have is we try to fix it on our own, right? I, I, when, I was, when Pastor Isaac was talking about that, I was feeling a little bit guilty because I, I like to fix things on my own. But God is calling us to ask him and recognizing he is the one to help us. Then the key verse that we've been thinking about all the way through is in Luke chapter 19, verse 10. In fact, it comes just before our text this morning. In Luke chapter 19, verse 10, Jesus is talking about um, the, the disciples of just uh, this amazing story of someone coming to know him. And, and he says this, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. The whole point of why Jesus, he's calling himself here the Son of Man, came into the world. The whole reason why God the Father sent his Son into the world was to come and to seek and to save that which was lost. The whole reason why God has brought his Son Jesus is to redeem or bring salvation or bring people back into a right relationship with himself. God is busy doing that. So many people have a wrong view of God, that he's looking to judge. He's looking to find a way to criticize you. But the fact is, is we already stand judged because we have done wrong against a holy God. Their judgment has already been sealed. But God has broken through that judgment with his grace and his mercy through his son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ came into the world, giving up his glory, giving up his home, giving up heaven, giving up the worship of all the angels, and giving up not having to be a human being with all the problems we deal with. You know? And he came down so that he might bring redemption, salvation, forgiveness to all people who would actually willingly say, I want to follow Jesus. We choose to follow him. We then receive his grace. We receive his forgiveness. And we have this wonderful thing. But Jesus did that so that the world might be saved. So the point of the book of Luke is to talk about Jesus. And the point of Jesus' life, according to this verse, was to come and to seek and to save that which was lost. It wasn't about comfort. It wasn't about immediate gratification. It wasn't about trying to make people feel good. It wasn't even about trying to save his reputation or have people think good about him. He actually had a greater goal than all that. He recognized that the world already stood condemned because every human being has, at least in some way, small or large, rebelled against a holy God. And because of that, judgment is, is basically certain. And he doesn't want that certainty. He wants people to be in relationship to God. And so he gave his own son, he gave his own self so that we might have a relationship with him. So he came for that purpose. Now, why am I telling you all that? Well, because that, that's really kind of important. And this message this morning is going to be talking about coming out of Luke chapter 19. If you have your Bibles, I'll have it up on the screen here. I'm going to read the story to you this morning. It's Luke chapter 19, verses 11 through 27. So listen along as I read the story and think about what's happening, Okay. Jesus is getting ready to die. This is a week away from his death. So if Jesus sounds a little strong to you, recognize that all the stakes are up. Like, he is ready to lay down his life. And the reason he's going to lay down his life is going to be very front and center in his mind. And now he's talking to his disciples and he's calling them to something greater than maybe what they've been thinking about. So recognize the situation. In a week, Jesus is going to die on a cross. Okay? While they were listening to this, the disciples... He went on to tell them a parable. Because he was near Jerusalem, and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. And people were ready to see Jesus become king. And he said, A man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king. So here's a, a man of noble birth who lives in a certain area, a certain region, and now he's going away from that region to become appointed as king. And it says... Um, and then to return, verse 12, verse 13. So he appointed, he, so he called ten of his servants and gave them ten mina, 
So these minas are basically three to four months wages. So in our current context, depending upon what your wage is, that could be anything from $15,000 to $50,000, $60,000. He gave them about three to four months wages so they could go ahead and invest this for the kingdom. So he said, a nobleman of his birth went to a distant country to give himself appointed a king and then returned in verse 13. So he called ten of his servants and gave them ten minas. Put this to work. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. And so he gave him a charge. He was going to go... And he said, put this money to work until I come back, in verse 14. But his subjects, those are the people who are living in the region, the people who lived in that town were under his authority. His subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. And so now the people living in that region who are actually under his authority are, are as he goes to this far-off country to become appointed king, they're sending a delegation to say, we don't want this guy to be our king. Okay? So, verse 15, but, verse 15, he doesn't say a but, but he says, he was made king, <laughs> verse 15, however, <laughs> and returned home. Those subjects probably aren't happy about that. Then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it, verse 16. The first one came and, and said, sir, your mina has earned ten more. Not bad. We don't know how long this was between when he left and when he came back, but we do know that this one servant now has gained ten times what he was given. Verse 17, Well done, my good servant, his master replied, because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter. Take charge of ten cities. Wow. Unbelievable. And the second came and said, Sir, your your mina has earned five more. Nice. His master answered, You take charge of five cities. So now the king has come back, he's ruling over a region, and he's giving authority to these people who have been faithful to him and what they asked, what he did, asking what he did. Then verse 20, then the, another servant came and said, sir, here is your mina. I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man, and you take out what you did not put in, and you reap what you did not sow. Verse 22, his master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I am a hard man, taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow? So now this servant seems to have the judgment against the king or against the appointed king and seems to have an attitude about how the king behaves. And so now the king is actually holding this servant an account to how he thought his judgment was going to be. He says, Why then, verse 23, didn't you put my money on deposit, like at a bank, so that when I came back, I would have collected it with interest? Then he said to those standing by, take his mina, take his fifteen dollars to $30,000 away from him and give it to the one who has ten times that, the guy who has 400000 bucks. Give it to him. Sir, they said, he he already has ten. Our view of fairness, right? That doesn't seem fair. He already has 10. He replied, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what, he, what they have will be taken away. Wow. How many think this is starting to sound a little like not the, the soft, baby, gentle Jesus we knew? Well, he's getting ready for his death, and he's, he's calling the stakes up, and he's being serious. Look what he says in verse 27. But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Wow, this is quite a parable. This is quite a parable. What can we learn from this parable? Well, we could spend a lot of time here dissecting this parable. And if you've been in church for a long time, you start to think, oh, I've read that parable before the book of Matthew. And it didn't sound quite like that. There were some differences between those two parables. And you're absolutely right. These are not actually the same parables, though there are some similarities in the stories. They're very different. I mean, some of the differences, if you knew that story in Matthew, you discover that, that, the, the, that the king gave the servants, three of the servants, one a certain amount, the next one another amount, and the next one another amount. And this one, there are ten servants, and all of them get the same amount. That's interesting. Uh, There are differences in this story, and we're going to talk about some of those differences, but we're not going to really focus on that right now. We're going to think about what is this story overall teaching us? What are some things we can bring out? If you look into your bulletins, you'll see some sermon notes. I would encourage you to pull those out and to take out a pen 
If you need a pen, raise your hand, and we can try to get you a pen. One of our ushers can get you a pen. And, and what's, we're going to go into, what are some things that we can learn from this story? As followers of Jesus Christ, if you're in this room and you say, I follow Jesus, I want to be his follower, well, then I think he's speaking to us specifically this morning. And one of the things he's saying is this, wait for the kingdom. Can you write that down? Wait for the kingdom. See, Jesus is specifically referring to waiting for the kingdom because if you look at the text, you see that in verse 11 to 13. It says, because he was near Jerusalem, and can you read this with me? The people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. So what were people thinking about the kingdom? It was going to happen right now. And so as he's getting ready, Jesus is getting ready to die. You think he knows that, okay? And he's getting ready to rise again. He's getting ready to leave, okay? What he knows is, is that the people are thinking he's going to be here right now. He's going to come back right away. But actually, he's giving us this parable. He's telling us this parable so we can understand, as followers of Jesus Christ, that he knew he was going to take some time before he came back. And that we need to think about that as we go about the kingdom life. If I say I'm a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm thinking about, Jesus, what do you want me to do? And I'm thinking he's going to come back immediately, which we believe as Christians that he can come back at any time. We do believe that. But our attitude about our behavior in terms of what we do needs to be connected to the fact that he may take some time to come. And if he's going to take time, how are we thinking about that? How are we investing? How are we, how are we stewarding our, our gifts, our money? our energies, our resources, whatever we have, how are we stewarding them for his kingdom? How are we thinking about that? And I think Jesus is calling us out to think maybe a little bit differently than maybe haphazard or erratic, maybe a little more strategic and more planned out in our approach to using the resources that we have for his kingdom. So we see that in, verse, uh, in verses 11 through 13. In fact, if you were to skip down to verse 13, you'd read, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. So right away, as Jesus walks into Jerusalem, they start to throw down palm branches and call him king. They're ready for the kingdom to appear right then. And Jesus is saying, uh, we've got to wait here, guys, a little bit. Look at what it says in verse 12, if, you don't, if you're not grabbing it with me. Look what it says in verse 12. He said, a man of noble birth went to, be, uh, went to a distant country. Can you say that with me? Went to a distant country. Do you think Jesus put that there on purpose? I'm thinking he did, okay? He went to a distant country, okay, and then had himself appointed as king and then to return. So the, the first point I think Jesus is really trying to help his disciples and those of us who are following him to understand is, is that we're going to have to wait for his return. Now, it could be that he comes back any moment. We don't know when he's going to return, but he's letting us know that, it could, that he already knew it was going to take some time. We, he already understood that. And so he's letting his disciples know then. But how many of us know that well, we've been waiting for 2,000 years, right? And we're like, come on back, Jesus, ready time. But you know what Jesus said, and what Peter says in 1 Peter, he tells us the reason why he doesn't come back quickly is because he wants more and more people to come into relationship with himself. See, if Jesus came back immediately right now, all of those people who don't want to follow Jesus won't have an opportunity to make a different choice. And if you're like me, I kind of want the people that I love who don't really like Jesus very much to learn how to love Jesus so that when he comes back, they can be with him. Anyone like me in this room? You follow that? So that's an important point. So why is, he, why is he delaying? Well, there's many reasons, but one of them is because he wants more people to come to know him and to follow him and to have that forgiveness that he offers. The second point I want to bring out this point from, from the text, and I think it's straight out of the text, is, is that we need to invest until he returns. And I really think this is the, one of the primary thoughts that Jesus is pushing into in the text. We as followers of Jesus Christ those of us who are saying we are Christ followers, we need to actually recognize that the kingdom is coming, the Lord is going to return, and that he's giving us a task. He's giving us an assignment. He's actually told us something to do. And we need to take what he's asked us to do, and we need to take it very seriously. And I think this is one of those very serious points. Jesus is getting ready to die, and so he's telling us this particular parable, I think because he recognizes Time is short, and he has to kind of bring it to a bear. He has to help the disciples really realize how significant, how important this is. So he's telling them this. Look in verse 13. Put this money to work, and he said, until I come back. So he gave his servants resources, and then he said to them, put it to work. So here's resources, and now do something with it. I really think this, this is connected to us as believers. 
Many people, uh, you know, would say, well, I don't have the gifts that Pastor Isaac has or, or Pastor Jason has or, or so-and-so, and I can't play the flute like Laura or I can't. Well, how many of us are different? All of us. And all of us have something that's really important, which is those of us who decided to follow Jesus Christ and have placed our faith in him, we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us, and we have a hope and a purpose. We know we have forgiveness that's given to us by Jesus, and we have a message about the forgiveness that Christ brought into our life. And we are to invest ourselves, all that we are, because we are a gift from God. We are to invest that back into the kingdom so that others might know God and might come to follow him. This is what God has called us to do. We call this being on mission as Christians. We call this being on mission. And we saw that the, the mission that Jesus had was to seek and to save that which was lost. That was the whole point of why he came, Luke 19.10. That was what he was all about. And as we see, this is, the, this is the reality for us. I think it reminds me of the last command Jesus gave us in the Bible. In, in, in Matthew chapter 28, Jesus says to his disciples just before, after he died and rose again. He was with his disciples for a little time, and he said this just before he sent it up into heaven and hasn't returned since. His last words to his disciples were, go and make disciples. I think it's the same parallel as Jesus is giving this story about the master who gave resources to his servants. That was a very physical, tangible illustration of what Jesus was telling us as disciples that we are to go and make disciples. This is our command. The last command our king has given to us is to go and make disciples. And he says he's going to come back. I'm ready, okay? I want him to come back. But he's actually given us a very specific command. Go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you even till the end of the age. And so this is the command Jesus has given to us and I think Jesus is referring back to this to his disciples. The next point I think Jesus is really bringing out in this parable, and I, this is kind of a new idea. In fact, I've read this parable hundreds of times. But this week, as I was reading it, and we talked about it in our staff meeting, this is the first time I actually saw this point. So maybe for you, you already knew this point. But for me, it was the very first time I saw this point. Jesus is telling his disciples that as they try to invest, as they try to bring other people to God, as they try to grow the kingdom, it will be a hostile environment. Can you write that down? It will be a hostile environment. Well, you say, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that, Pastor Phil? Well, take a look. Take a look at the text, verse 14. But his subjects, can you read it with me? But his subjects hated him, and they sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be king And isn't that what we see today? How many people in your neighborhood, at your workplace, are saying, I want Jesus to be king of my life? Like, woo! Let's have a Jesus king party right now. Like, can I please let Jesus lord my life and make, I take my cues, my direction, my resources, my decisions, all of it's going to go through the, the bandwidth of Jesus first. I want that. How many think your neighbors and friends and coworkers and people who live in this community and the communities around us, that's their first thought. How many of you know that that is not people's first thought? And if I try to actually make Jesus first and encourage them to consider that, how many think there might be some resistance to that thought? That's the reality that we live in. Jesus is telling his disciples that these guys, that the kingdom, the people who are supposed to actually follow the king, which... And the reality, those who were created by God should actually submit to God, but they don't want to. He's saying, listen, in this story, you're going to have to go back as people who have my money and try to make it grow in an environment where people hate me. Now, how many of you know that if you aren't uh, liked or the people that you're around aren't liked, that it's hard to do business deals in that environment? Okay, Hard to sell your wares and your trinkets. Hard to, hard to do work, hard to get the job mowing someone's grass if you're, you know, you're that kid who broke the window. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's tough. And Jesus is saying, those of you who know me as Savior and are now called as followers of Jesus Christ to go in to make disciples, you're going to go into a world which is antagonistic against me as their king. Can we all see that now? It's really true, isn't it? So it's important. Here you want to write this back down again. It will be a hostile environment. Jesus isn't missing that. He's not like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize it was going to be so hard. 
No, 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 no. He knew. He gave the parable before he died. He showed us before he died, this is going to be hard. Here's a really important point. Well, they're all important, but this is really important. Ready? He will return. Can you say that with me? He will return. A little bit louder. He will return. This is an important thought. We're not talking about la la fairyland, oh, some kind of fairy tale. We're talking about the God of the universe who sent his son to redeem us from all sin. And now that his son has gone up into heaven, now he's been given all authority and all power, and he's going to come back as king. That will happen. And when he comes as king, there will be a day of reckoning. There will be a reality to that. And all people, whether they want to believe him or not, whether they care about him or not, whether they don't think anything about God or not, it won't matter because they won't have any more choice in the matter at that point. He will come back, and as king, he will bring reckoning. He's king, and he will return. Look at verse 15. After verse 14, they hated him, wanted him not to be there. Verse 15, I like how it's written. He was made king. (laughs) They sent a delegation to stop it. We had a protest, had our picket signs. We said, well, we don't want God to be God. We want ourselves to be God. We want to do our own thing. We don't want God to be God. Well, does that change God being God when people just sit there and shake their fist at him? He was made king. Okay? Boom, boom, boom. However, and returned home, and then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out. Did you read this? In order to find out what they had gained with it. See, when the king comes back, he will take count. He will bring justice, and he will hold all of us, those of us who know Jesus, and those of us who decide not to want to follow Jesus, he will hold all of us accountable. There's no one missing in his account. The king is a righteous king, and he's strong. And Jesus is giving us this strong view of himself because it's serious days now. He's getting ready to die, and he wants people to understand what's really happening. So we grab that. He will return. It's a hostile environment. So as a believer in Jesus, now I want to see people come to know Christ. I want to grow the kingdom. I want to invest myself, everything that I have, my gifts, my abilities, my resources, my status, my whatever I have to help grow the kingdom of God. And so I'm investing myself in every possible way. And I need to remember he will return. And I'm going to be held accountable at some point, And that's an important thought. But this is where I think the largest point crescendos in the point of Jesus' message here. I think he just, I think he just rises to the top. And I think this is the very, very, the pinnacle of his thought is right here. And the way I've worded it is this way. Can you write it down? Risk it all. Ready? Risk it all. Say it with me, church. Risk it all. Let's say it. A couple of you don't believe this, right? Let's all of us act like we believe this. Ready? Risk it all. And don't live in fear. Ready? Let's try that again. Risk it all. Don't live in fear. I think this is a largest point that Jesus is making. Yes, he wants us to invest ourselves. Yes, he wants to grow the kingdom. Yes, he wants us to use all the resources we have to given to us to grow his kingdom. He wants us to do that, but he wants us to understand that he wants us to risk it all. And Pastor Isaac and I were having a wonderful conversation about why isn't there a negative example of these servants when they come back and one who failed and now he's going to get, or one who failed and didn't bring back enough money because he spent it all and he tried to make it work and it didn't work out and he failed with his, his business proposition and so now he only has like, Three quarters of a mina. Why is there no negative, no negative example, both in the Matthew passage, which is parallel, and this passage here? And I love Pastor Isaac's insight, and I fully agree with it. It's because when we risk for God, he's with us. Amen? When we risk for God, he's with us, and he helps us to grow things. He helps us to do things that we can never take credit for. I mean, how many of us have done stuff for God, and it actually worked out, and we know, and we look back, it wasn't us at all. That God was the one who met us here and here and here and here. He's the one who who protected us from our own stupidity, our own bad decision-making, our own whatever, our naive perspectives. And he used what we had, our willingness, our desires, our resources, our gifts, our talents. And he did something for his kingdom and for his glory because we risked it all. But the person who lives in fear... God is this big bully who has these massive expectations of me, and because they're so high, I can't move. I think a lot of people think that. I think a lot of Christians feel that way. And they sit on their hands in fear, worried 
if they're going to do something wrong, take a wrong step, make a wrong decision, and somehow God isn't big enough to overcome our, you know, our decision. I think Jesus is really pushing into this point. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 and 11 says, For we must all appear, Paul now, the apostle, is speaking to Christians, not talking to people who don't know God, he's talking to Christians. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. Can we say it together, church? We try to persuade others. Let's try that again. Verse 11. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. There's an important reality as believers, those of us who know Jesus. We might be forgiven so that we're going to go to heaven, but God is still holding us accountable for our choices in our day-to-day life. The Bible says there's no idle word that's ever spoken. We'll have to give an account. And so we can be living in such fear that we're going to make a misstep, we're going to not do it right, that we actually never act. And, we, and when, the, when the king comes back and says, what did you do with what I gave you? We say, well, I, I held on to it. I didn't lose it. It's like, well, did you invest it? Did you grow my kingdom? Did you, did you make disciples? Did you invest in my... Well, no, I was afraid I was going to make a mistake. I might lose something, and so I didn't do anything. Verse 20, right? Then another servant came and said, Sir, where is your mina? I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. Verse 21, I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. My view of God changes how I behave. Now, in the church, we often use the word amen. It simply means I agree, okay? So can we say that I agree? Ready? Our view of God changes the way we behave. I agree. I agree. This person had a wrong view of God. And his wrong view of God paralyzed him from doing the things that God asked him to do. And Jesus, I think, is really speaking right into that. And he's pushing on that. Yes, he is God. Yes, he will give an account. Yes, he is strong. Yes, there is an accounting. Yes, there is truth to all that. But we serve an amazingly gracious, loving, and good God who wants good things for us. And in this story, Jesus is going to show his hard hand, his difficult hand, his, his negative hand. We're going to see a negative portion of Jesus' view here, but he's trying to push against the idea that he's this evil person. He says in verse 22, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. So right there, how does Jesus feel about people who say they follow him, and yet they don't trust him to go build his kingdom? He's not really very happy about that. I don't know how else to frame that. That's a negative thought. In verse 26, replied, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what they have will be taken away. Now, I don't want to get too complicated here, but if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, what does, that does not mean is that you're going to go to hell for not being a great Christian. It doesn't mean that. It just means that at the end there are rewards, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. And, and God wants to honor the work that you do, the hard labor that you do, the sacrifices that you make. He is going to honor each one of those. And if we've chosen not to, if we've chosen not to participate in his command to go make disciples, then everything he's given to us will be taken from us, and we're going to make it to heaven, and we'll be with him, and that will be glorious, and we'll have forgiveness. But we're not going to get all of the benefits that he wants to give us once we get there. And so he says, even what you have will be taken away doesn't mean that you're going to be eternally condemned. You see that at the end of the text there in verse 27. doesn't mean that. But it does mean that if you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you've been given a command and you're not obeying it, out of fear you're holding yourself back and not actually giving everything, then you're confused. And God isn't happy about that behavior. Here's a point, an important point. Can you say it with me? <clears throat> there will be a reward. There will be a reward. Let's say it. There will be a reward. And I want to tell you, it will be worth it. It will be worth all the risk. There will be a reward. You write this down in your notes. And it will be worth all the risk. 
whatever sacrifice, whatever giving, time, money, energy, resources, risking um, the idea of value, person, status, and the, the way you look in the, the culture, the way people see you and not see you, you're, you're risking your job and you're, the way people think about you, all these risks that you have taken as a follower of Jesus Christ because you want other people to know Jesus and come to follow him, all those risks, they are not lost. They're not. Look what it says in Revelation chapter 22, verse 12. This is Jesus now at the end of the book of Revelation, at the end of all time. He's coming back as king. He says, look, I'm coming soon, and my reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. Isn't that exciting? God is not lost on what you've done. Though no one else may ever notice it or ever see it, or no one recognizes it. There isn't some big award at the church ceremony saying, you have been wonderful. And God has known what you've done, what you've sacrificed, what you've given. And he's not, he's a good accountant. He's really good. And he's going to give you a reward. Luke 18, verse 27, uh, verse 16 says, the first one came and said, sir, your mina has earned 10 more. This guy took the 15 to 20,000. We don't know how much it was. Let's say it's $30,000. And he invested it. And by the time the king came back, he had 300,000 bucks. How many, have, how many if you were the king going, good job, buddy, right? And so we can too. You know the parable of the sower who puts seed into different types of soil? Some of that soil returns 50, 100 fold. Jesus said in John chapter 15, he says, if you abide in me and I abide in you, you will bear much fruit. Can you say this with me? If you abide in me and I abide in you, you will bear much fruit. Now, how many think Jesus is a liar? Now, I know that seems an obvious statement, but Jesus makes this very clear declaration. If I abide in him and he abides in me, he will use my life to produce fruit. God wants you. He puts you here. He's given you as a servant. He's given you mina. He's given you something to invest to grow his kingdom. And he promises a reward for your hard work and for your labor. And that he is, he is going to give it. Look, the second man came in verse 18 and said, Sir, your mina has earned five more. And the return which the servant gave was keeping with the reward in which the kingdom was given. He was given five cities, right? Guys, risk everything because it's worth it all. Verse, verse 27 of Matthew says this. Jesus replied, what is impossible with man is possible with God. This is actually in Luke. And Jesus was talking about the rich man has a hard time coming to heaven. And, 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 and the disciples are like, what's going to happen? The rich man has a hard time getting to heaven. And Jesus says, well, no, no, no. You guys, he can come. It doesn't mean he can't come. It just means it's hard. And Jesus says to them in the, verse 27, he says, what is impossible with man is possible with God. What is impossible with man is possible with God. And Peter says to him, but we left all we had to follow you. We've given everything. And he says, truly I tell you, Jesus said to them, no one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come. Is God going to reward those who sacrifice for him? Yeah, I think so. It was 1997 we left to go to Toronto. But you know what? I'm really glad we went. I'm glad we, we went to Toronto. You know how many mistakes we made? Thousands. Not, not hundreds. Thousands of mistakes. Little, big, all kinds of in process. I, have, I think I have a picture here. You know what? Because Grace Community Church started in 1998. Because some people who didn't do it perfectly risked to go where they had to make sacrifices to go and now there's a church now, actually, if we think about what's going on in Toronto, there's over 500 people in three different church locations who are following Jesus Christ, and over 400 people have been baptized and been saved over the last 20 years because there was a couple of people who didn't perfectly know what they were doing but risked for the kingdom. You understand? I'm not bragging about that. I'm trying to tell you something. I'm trying to help you see. 
that we think that if we risk, we're going to fail. And we might fail in human terms, but God knows what is done and how it's done, and he will bring a return for all of the things that we risk for his kingdom. Are we about his kingdom? Is it at first? Is we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness? Are we thinking about how we're going to seek and to save that which is lost? Are we going to follow the command of Jesus Christ to go and make disciples? Is that going to be what we give everything for? Or is there something else? Because for Jesus, he's getting ready to lay it down. He's getting ready to die on a cross in a couple of days from this, 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 this little story he's telling. And he's laying it all down. He's asking us to follow him. And when we left our home and we, and we lost our house, we moved to this place called Community of Hope. I think we have another slide. And there it was in 19, uh, 90, uh, 2007, September 9th, right? Some of you are in that picture, aren't you? Because you too, many of you, risked to come and to start a new church in this community. And now, over 100 people have come to Christ in the last 11 years. And we started a new church in Medicine Hat, Alberta, because of the risk that they took and we risked together. And now we've adopted a church in Island, Island of Hope in Bow Island. Why? Because we're great at this? How many know we really stink at this? Okay? Or because God's with us, amen? And God is with us and he wants to do stuff with us because we risk for him. And he's going to meet us here. And even in this life and in the one to come, there'll be great reward. There'll be great reward. We need to remember that God is good. And my last point is not a positive point, and I apologize for that, but that's the way the text is written this morning. And it's this. Sadly, those who reject will be condemned. Remember the, the people who rode out on their horses to tell they bring an envoy out to say that we don't want this guy to be king. Remember those guys? The subjects, the one who God created in his image and made them and gave them every opportunity to find forgiveness through his son, who he allowed his son to die and be killed so that they might have forgiveness from the father. The one who he raised his son up from the dead so they might have hope of eternal life. The one, these people who have rejected Jesus Christ, there is no hope for them. And that's what this text is also telling us. I don't like it. I don't think it's a fun passage, that part of it. But there's a reality when the king returns, there will be judgment. And when the king returns, it's final. There isn't any, oh, maybe we can hopefully go through a billion years of purgatory. No, 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 no. When the king returns, there will be judgment. And when we look at the text, it's not positive, right? In verse 27, you see in the text, it tells us, But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. I recognize it's a very negative thing to say. But I think sometimes we have made Jesus not God and not the rightful ruler of the universe. And we've been so busy trying to soft sell everything that we've lost the reality that in eternity, there are those who follow Jesus and find his forgiveness and are with him forever and those who have rejected him and can no longer receive his forgiveness. That's the truth. And so this morning I want to say to you that everything you have is worth it. The kingdom is worth it. Ben, as you come, I'm going to pray. The kingdom is worth it. This life is temporary. It's very short. We're not going to be here very long. And whatever you sacrifice and give to grow the kingdom of God means that there are more and more people who will know Jesus Christ and find forgiveness and have hope in him. And the more we decide we're not going to surrender and sacrifice for the kingdom, the, the less and less activity we can produce and the less fruit we produce. And then when we, we end all of this life and we had our comfortable house and our comfortable home and our comfortable friendships and our comfortable, you know, always schedule that we never got interfered with because we didn't have people in our lives, we realize at the end of all time that God is creator universe and he's going to be king and I'm going to, I'm going to have to talk to him. And then forever, the things that I've done on this earth will affect my eternity. And he wants to give us great reward. He wants to give us wonderful rewards. He wants us to be in relationship with him. But ultimately, is, it is a choice. And even though he's a gracious God, he's actually very just. Let's pray. Father, I thank you this morning for your word. Some of this part of this word, Lord, is really...